This is the South Bank in London. 2,000 years ago, if you'd heard a human voice around here, the language would have been incomprehensible. A 1,000 years ago, the English language had established its first base camp. Today, English circles the globe. It inhabits the air we breathe. What started as a guttural tribal dialect, seemingly isolated in a small island, is now the language of well over a thousand million people around the world. The story of the English language is an extraordinary one. It has the characteristics of a bold and successful adventure, tenacity, luck, near extinction on more than one occasion, dazzling flexibility, and an extraordinary power to absorb. And it's still going on. New dialects, new Englishes are evolving all the time, all over the world. Successive invasions introduced, then threatened to destroy our language. Our first program tells that story. For 300 years, English was forced underground. Our second program tells how it survived and how it fought back. Our third program will tell how the English language took on the power blocks of church and state. Our fourth, how it became the language of Shakespeare. In later programs, we're going to leave these shores as English did, to tell the story of how in America, the language of one great empire became that of another. We'll go to the Caribbean, where a variety of new part English dialects took root. India, where English became a commanding, unifying language in a country of a thousand tongues. And Australia, where a confident new English was invented by a people, many of whom had been expelled from their mother country. We'll travel through time, too, to explore how English in the 21st century has become the international language of business, the language in which the world's citizens communicate. Over the last 1,500 years, these small islands have achieved much that is remarkable. But in my view, England's greatest success story of all is the English language. These programs are about the words we think in, talk in, write in, sing in, the words that describe the life we live. This is where we can begin, just after dawn, in a foreign country, on a flat shore by the North Sea, in what we now call the Netherlands. This is Friesland, and it's in this part of the world that we can still hear the modern language that we believe sounds closest to what the ancestor of English sounded like 1,500 years ago. And that's what Maart nog even besuggen. Maart hebben we toch wel een aantal dagen rond met Froest. Ja, Friese die het op zijn jonge dagen dat vooral onder groen. In Friesland, many people start their day listening to the weather forecast from popular weatherman Piet Palusma. En dan man die, tiesje en waasje. Het worden dagen. Some of his words might sound familiar, like three and four, frost and freeze. Een temperatuur zo met de beide treien of de vijfde graden. Geen frost, het zal net vriezen. Mist and blue. Vierdes de kans op mist. And then moon, a day may flink wat zinnen. Blauw in de loft. The reason we can recognize these words is that modern Frisian and modern English can both be traced back to the same family, the Germanic family of languages. And some words have stayed more or less the same down the centuries. Butter, bread, cheese, meal, sleep, boat, snow, sea, storm.
The West Germanic tribes who invented these words were a warlike, adventurous people. They'd been on the move through Europe for the best part of a thousand years and now had settlements in what we would call the lowlands of Northern Europe, Holland, Germany and Denmark. But they were still greedy for land, ready to move on. This is the island of Terschelling. The English coast is about 250 miles to the southwest behind me. It was from these islands and the low-lying Frisian mainland that in the 5th century, a Germanic tribe, part of the family that also contained Jutes, Angles and Saxons, made sail to look for a better life. And they took their language, our language, with them. Us mid flodabar, on ran rada hiak stef naka, snilche semiark, snude bewunden, uthat with this early oda land gesokten, Wara be reckona, swires wind for draft. The Germanic tribes weren't the first to invade our shores. More than 500 years before, the Romans had also come by sea to impose their will. Now their empire had crumbled, and they'd abandoned these islands, leaving the native tribes, the Britons or Celts, to their fate. This is Pevensey Castle an ancient Roman fort that used to stand on the very shoreline of the south coast. The chronicle of the period reports that in the year 491, Germanic invaders laid siege and slaughtered the Celts who'd taken refuge here. Not one of them was left alive. Other Celts did survive the invasion, a million or more of them in England, but they were a broken people. The clue to their fate lies in the word the Germanic tribes used to describe them. It was Wilas, a name that lives on in our modern language as Welsh. 1,500 years ago, it meant both foreigner and slave. The Celts became servants and followers, second-class citizens. The only way up was to become part of the invaders' tribes, to adopt their culture and their language. The Celts and their language were pushed to the margins. Only a handful of words from the Celtic languages survive into modern English. In the north, where I come from, we have crag, meaning rock, coombe, meaning deep valley, and dialect words like brat and brock for badger. There are traces in place names. The Tor in Tropenna, spelled as Torpen Howe, a neighboring village to my own, that comes from the Celtic for peak, The car of Carlisle means a fortified place. In the south, they left us the names of Thames and Avon, Dover and London. But these were fragments. The language that prevailed was that of the victors. By the end of the 6th century, these Germanic tribes occupied half of mainland Britain. They had divided into a number of kingdoms. Kent, Sussex, Essex and Wessex, denoting the settlements of southern, eastern and western Saxon tribes. East Anglia, named after the Angles who gave England its name. Mercia in the Midlands, Northumbria in the north. Throughout these areas, many modern place names come from that settlement or use the words they brought. We live with them. We live in them every day. The ing in modern place names means the people of. Ton, as in Wickton where I come from, means enclosure or village. Ham means farm, which might surprise one or two Tottenham supporters. The Germanic tribes now settled around the country all spoke their own dialects. From among them would emerge one language, Anglo-Saxon or Old English, and we all speak it every day.
With that fire strikers, none of them can really finish. Armstrong, even some natural sharing. They just need some youth and, yeah, and pace. Right, really. Examine the language you use today, and you'll still find hundreds of words from a language over 1,500 years old. Keywords ranging from the names we give family members to numbers. Gardener also. What do you reckon today? I think we'll win two ones today. So I'll drink to that. I live in like a West Ham sort of area, and I've got a lot of West Ham friends. Um, but for this game, we'll be enemies. For the home games, I would go with uh, the guys we meet up from the Top Spurs website, or with my daughter to other games. I and mean, she's five at the moment. Um, loves it. She loves singing the songs, the nice ones anyway. I was coming with my son, so we just go and get something to eat first. Um, go into the ground, stay with the atmosphere and watch the game. There has been a few high scoring games over the years. I think the highest we ever beat them was 6 1. Um, a repeat today wouldn't go and miss. Most of those words were from Old English. Nouns like youth, son, daughter, field, friend, home, and ground. Prepositions like in and on, into, by, and from. And and the are from Old English. All the numbers and verbs like drink come and go, sing, like and love. But would these words have sounded different all those years ago? In a slightly quieter pub, I ask language expert Katie Lowe. They sound a little different. I mean, the Old English for sun is sunu. That's not so very different. Game is garmen. Uh, ground is grunt. Um, and uh, I noticed that Steve says his, his daughter loves uh, singing songs. If you said that in Old English, it would be his daughter lova the sangas singen. And you can see that that sounds pretty much like modern English. So, in fact, you can have a good conversation in Old English. Oh, yes, you can indeed. I mean, each, each word I'm saying now is from Old English. Have you any estimate how many words there were swirling around compared with how many words we have now? We think it was in the region of 25,000 words. Um, compare that with an average desk dictionary, which maybe contains something like 100,000 words. It sounds pretty small. But if you think about the fact that a, an averagely educated person will probably have about 10,000 words in their active vocabulary, there are plenty of words to go round. English took its first steps away from its tribal roots with the revival of Christianity. No, we shulan herian. He often reaches we art. Method is mikta and his mood githunk. Let us praise the King of Heaven, the power of the Creator and his conception, the work of the glorious Father who created every wonder, the Eternal Lord. He often to rufa, halik shipend. In 597, the monk and prior Augustine led a mission from Rome to Kent. Around the same time, Irish monks of the Celtic Church were establishing a presence in the north. Within a century, Christians built churches and monasteries. This is St. Paul's in Jarrow, parts of which date from the 7th century. Faith and stone weren't the only things the Christian missionaries brought to the country. They brought the international language of the Christian religion, Latin. Latin terms became part of the English word hoard. Altare became altar. Apostolus became apostle. Mass, monk and verse and many others all come from the Latin. This would become a pattern of English, the layering of words taken from different source languages. And from Latin too, the English took their script. The Angles, Saxons, Frisians and Jutes, who had become the English, hadn't brought script as we know it with them, but runes. The runic alphabet was made up of symbols formed mainly of straight lines, so that the letters could be carved into stone or wood. Those were their media, rather than parchment or paper. Though this is a short poem, most examples of runic writing that survive suggest runes were mainly used for short, practical messages or graffiti.
The Latin alphabet was different. With its curves and bows, it allowed words to be easily written using pen and ink onto pages of parchment or vellum, which, gathered together into a book, could be widely circulated. Christianity brought the book to these shores. Verbum, the word. Soon a native culture of scholarship began to flower, a culture based on Latin and on writing. The magnificent Lindisfarne Gospels were created in the 8th century on the island of Lindisfarne, just off the northeast coast. A few miles south, at the monastery of St. Paul's in Gyro, the great English monk and scholar Bede, born and educated in Northumbria, began writing the first ever history of the English-speaking people. He wrote, of course, in Latin, the language of scholarship. The prevailing language among the people was still Old English, but Latin, this powerful medium, was now amongst them. Now, Old English was written down using the Latin alphabet while retaining some of the old runes as letters. From the 7th century, we find English itself written on parchment in a language and a script which we can just about recognize as our own. Father Usher, who art in he of new. Siga Halgard no madin, to kumath richer din, si willow din swa is in hiofne and in eortho. Hlaf usirne of wislich selos today, and for gifus shulda usra swa we for gifon shuldgem usem, and the inlaid usi in custom. With writing, Old English stole a march on other languages spoken in Europe at the time. Prayers were recorded and books of the Bible translated. The laws of the land were written down and the language soon became capable of recording and expressing an increasingly wide and subtle range of human experience. And in the right hands, Old English was now powerful and supple enough to take you to imaginary worlds, fire the blood, be poetry. What? We gardener in Yardawum. Theod Kuninger, Thrumge Frunon. So, the Spear Danes in days gone by, and the kings who ruled them had courage and greatness. We have heard of those princes' heroic campaigns. No one knows who composed the epic Beowulf sometime between the mid 7th and end of the 10th century. It's the first great poem in the English language the beginning of a glorious tradition which will lead to Chaucer, Shakespeare and beyond. The poem celebrates the glory days of the Germanic tribes, epitomized in the heroic warrior who gives the poem its name. The power of the language can be heard in this passage, which introduces Beowulf's archenemy, the monster Grendel. The comb of Mora, under misliothem, Grendel Gongan. In off the moors, down through the mist bands, God cursed Grendel came greedily loping. The bane of the race of men roam forth, hunting for a prey in the high hall. Spurned and joyless, he journeyed on ahead and arrived at the bond. On bread the Biala Hudig, the Higaborgan was. Then his rage boiled over. He ripped open the mouth of the building, maddening for blood. He grabbed and mauled a man on his bench, bit into his bone lappings, bolted down his blood, and gorged on him in lumps, leaving the body utterly lifeless, eaten up hand and foot. What does that tell us about English at that time, Seamus? What sort of language was it when you came to it? Do you think this is a fully developed poetic language? It's certainly a fully developed poetic language. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's capable of great elaboration. But what, 
struck me generally about Old English from the moment I read the bits of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle right through to Beowulf is it's terrific for telling what happened. It's a, a wonderful sense of the indicative mood all through it. It's terrific for action, terrific for description. There's a wonderful forthright capacity to make up extra language in Anglo-Saxon. The words are, are very clear and direct. Bone and house, for example. Bone house, there you have the house for the body, a word for the body. Beautiful words for instruments. Uh, the harp is called uh, gleo beam, the glee beam. The happy, the happy wood, or else uh, the joy wood. Uh, I think so. Guman wudu. Swords uh, or shields. The shield is the war board, weak board. That is a specific poetic energy that's in the language. Uh, the. The, the ability to make compounds, which is still in German, I guess, that gives it a great beauty. How extensive is the vocabulary? I think there are 40,000 uh, words recorded in, in Beowulf. But a lot of the words repeat themselves. In, uh, uh, probably this is in poetry more than in the prose. If we heard an Anglo-Saxon speaker speaking uh, under his roof to his companion, we'd probably hear a very a quicker, a different less elaborate language from Beowulf. Would you say it, was, it is very clearly written to be read aloud? It's certainly written to be read aloud. The question that, that agitates some scholars is whether it was written, you know. But I think the general uh, consensus now is that by the time you get to Beowulf, you have a, a writer um, dealing with a traditional oral language. What we garden in Yardawum Theod Kuninga Thrumge Frunon, Hutha Athelingus Ellen Fremedon. Certainly, you, you open the book, What Wegardena and Yerdagmet asks to be uttered, and there are many speeches in it, and it comes off the tongue with, with terrific directness. I think. Latin and Greek had created great bodies of literature in the classical past. In the East, Arabic and Chinese were being used in the 8th and 9th century as languages of poetry. But at that time, no other language in the Christian world could match the achievement of the Beowulf poet and his anonymous contemporaries. Old English was flourishing. The adventure was underway. But while the seeds of English had come from these Frisian shores in the 5th century, so now, in the late 8th century, a potential destroyer was preparing his battle fleet 500 miles or so to the north. In the late 8th century, the Latin-based culture of scholarship, which had grown up in places like Lindisfarne and which had also been the cradle of Old English, faced extinction from across the sea. These ruins are of the medieval monastery that stood on the island of Lindisfarne. It was the Vikings who sacked and burned the religious center that stood here before. To these pagan pirates rampaging out of their longships in 793, this great center of Christian piety and scholarship, a pivotal place in the survival of the word and the gospels, was no more than an undefended treasure house. The jewels that graced the books of the church became baubles around a Viking's neck. <laughs> Today the Vikings may seem romantic, reenacting their rituals a good day out. Over 12 centuries ago their arrival was not so cheerful. 
To many, it seemed to signal the end for civilization. A year after raising Lindisfarne, the Vikings returned and sacked Jarrow, the abbey where Bede had been the greatest scholar in one of the finest libraries in Christendom. This stronghold of the Latin word, where English was also being written down uniquely among European dialects, was burned to the ground, its books with it. It was the start of 70 years of attack, during which the Vikings savaged this eastern half of the country. Few stories survive of exactly where and when they attacked, perhaps chillingly, because few were left to tell the tale. At first, the raiders went home with their plunder. Then they decided to take the land itself. In 865, the Vikings landed a great army south of here in East Anglia. Within five years, the Viking invaders, who were now called Danes, controlled the north and east of the country. Of the old Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, only Wessex still held out. Old Norse, the language of the conquerors, was spreading throughout the land. Old English potentially faced the same fate as the Celtic language it had supplanted, virtual oblivion. English was in need of a champion, and it found one. King Alfred's statue stands here in Winchester, the capital of his ancient kingdom of Wessex. He's the only monarch in our history to be known as the Great, and he's often been hailed as the saviour of England. That may be debatable, as the idea of a single unified England didn't really exist in Alfred's day. What is certain is that he was a great defender of the English language. It was the Victorians who dubbed Alfred the Great, he was one of their darlings, an English hero whose exploits were enthusiastically woven into the fabric of national myth. But he very nearly didn't make it. He'd come to the throne of Wessex within a year of the first Danish attacks in the southeast, and at first he could hardly hold them back. In 878, the Danes won what appeared to be a decisive battle at Chippenham in Wiltshire. Alfred, with only a few followers, went on the run into the marshes of Somerset, moving, as a contemporary wrote, under difficulties, through woods, and into inaccessible places. Legend has Alfred, unrecognized, taking shelter in a poor woman's cottage and being scolded for burning the wheaten cakes he'd been set to mind. But the reality was less cozy. His situation was desperate. And if Alfred's kingdom fell, the whole country would be controlled and settled by conquerors whose language would inevitably crush English. But Alfred proved to be an enterprising warrior and strategist. Running free in the Somerset levels, he discovered the arts of irregular warfare and mounted guerrilla attacks against the occupying forces of Guthrun, the Danish invader. But he knew that wasn't going to be enough. For Wessex to be regained, the Danes had to be brought to battle and defeated. The fighting men of Wessex had been scattered, but in the spring of 878, Alfred sent out a call for the men of the Shire Fjords, the county armies, to join him. Around 4,000 men, mainly from Wiltshire and Somerset, armed only with battle axes and throwing spears, responded to the call. They mustered at Egbert's Stone, where trackways and ridgeways met. 48 hours later, they advanced shields drumming against the Danish army of 5,000, holding high ground at Ethendune on the western edge of Salisbury Plain. Contemporary English accounts describe the battle that followed as a slaughter and a rout of the Danes by the West Saxons. Modern historians question that, but there's no doubt that Alfred prevailed. His crown and his kingdom were secured, and more importantly for our story, so was the English language.
the Danes surrendered, their leader was baptized as a Christian, and Alfred's crucial victory was memorialized here in Wiltshire in an earlier version of a great white horse carved into the land he'd saved. Alfred left an even more significant mark on the country. He signed a peace treaty with the Danes, which established a border running up through the country from the Thames to the old Roman road of Watling Street. The land to the north and east, to be known as the Danelaw, would be under Danish rule. The land to the south and west would be for the English. No one was to cross the line unless to trade. In the course of time, because of Alfred's peace treaty, when Danes and English met, they didn't do so to fight, but to do business, even to intermarry. Oh, yes. Communities mixed, and so did the languages. And English, rather than being engulfed by the Danes' language, began to absorb it. I'm in the market town of Hexham in the northeast of England. Maps of the area show just how widespread the Danish settlement was. Place names ending in by reveal the Danish name for farm. Thorpe denotes a village, Thwaite a portion of land. The births, marriages and deaths pages of the local paper feature lots of names ending in son. That was a Danish way of making a name by adding to the name of the father. Just on this page, I can see Harrison, Gibson Hudson, Robson, Sanderson, Dickinson, Simpson, Dickinson again, and Watson. In school where I was, just across the country, there was a Pattinson, a Johnson, a Rawlinson, and another Dixon. Outside in the street, you can see the same thing on shop signs everywhere. Even given centuries of people moving around the country, names ending in son are still far more common in what were the Danish territories of the north and west than they are in the south and east. Above all, you can hear the echoes of the Danes' Old Norse language in the way people speak. What did you say this? Charlie. 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 And out of uh, Sailor and then Limmy Coast. Uh, it's a little field on its own. As Willie says, there's a beck down by the side of it. Looks down through a little wood. And it's such a lovely setting down by the, uh, you know, down by in that thing, isn't it? It's like a little isolation field. It's only, it's only a couple of acres, the whole field. Isn't it? It'd be interesting to see a few sheep sold with lambs. It's what it means. Are they allowed to be sold tonight? Some Old Norse words stayed in the local dialects of the north. <laughs> words like beck for stream and garth for paddock. As a boy in Wickton, I remember hearing and using dialect words like slattery for shower, slape for slippery, yet for gate, laup for leap, yek for oak, and yam for home, as in asgang and yam. Pure Norse, heard in Wickton every night of the week. And there were many others. But the influence of Old Norse wasn't just local. All around the country over time, hundreds of Norse words entered the mainstream of English, and we still use them every day. The SK sound is a characteristic of Old Norse, and English borrowed words like score and sky and skive, as well as perhaps a thousand others, including anger, bull, freckle, knife, neck, root, skull, and window. Sometimes, where both Old Norse and Old English had a word for the same thing, both words lived on in English, each taking on a slightly different meaning. Where Old English said craft, Old Norse said skill. For an English hide, the Norse said skin. In Old English you were sick, in Norse you were ill. Here was another example of English's extraordinary ability to absorb, to take in words from other languages, adding them to its word hoard, increasing the richness and flexibility of the vocabulary. I think that the point about vocabulary is how much it astonishes by its ordinary nature. Words like law, egg, husband, leg, ill, die, ugly, all these words are from Old Norse, and yet you wouldn't necessarily think that they were foreign at all.
most astounding of all, I think, are the pronouns they, their and them. Those are also from Old Norse. And in terms of grammar, in a way, they simplified English, didn't they? They took it away from its Germanic roots. I think it's probably true to say that Old Norse affects the English language more than any other, because it actually leads to a restructuring of the language. Old English uh, formed sentences, and not by word order, as we do, but by tacking on endings onto the ends of things like articles and pronouns and nouns. Um, what happens is, through contact with a, a pretty similar language, um, a lot of these inflectional endings start to lose their distinctive nature. And actually, this is a process that we, we can see happening fairly early on in the Anglo-Saxon period. So the language is prone to do that, but contact with Norse languages speeded it up, gave it a shove towards modernity. Can you give us a very simple example of that? Yes. Uh, let's take a simple sentence like, um, the king gave horses to his men. That would be something like in Old English, se kuning geaf blanken his gumum. Now, in Old English, you didn't tend to have a preposition like to. Instead, you could use a special ending, which kind of meant to his men. And that would be um, a um ending. And you just tack that onto the end of the noun for man. So you'd have gumum. U.M. ending. Now, the plural for the word for horse, if you want to say gave horses to his men, would be have an N on it, so it would be blankan. Unfortunately, towards the end of the Old English period, we start to see that U.M. ending becoming more and more indistinct. And we see spellings like guman, A-N, just the same as blankan, A-N. And it's obvious that the king is more likely to give um, uh, horses to his men than men to his horses. But you can see that there's a potential there uh, for difficulties. And so we start to see um, prepositions being used in place of those endings, which should become indistinct. Spoken English survived the Danish invasion. But as the 9th century drew to a close, the written culture was in a ruinous state, and King Alfred was concerned. When Alfred looked at the state of his kingdom, he was appalled. The scholars in the monasteries had once made England the greatest powerhouse of Christian teaching in Europe. But 150 years had passed since the high days of Bede, and the scholarly tradition had declined, hastened on its way by a century of Viking raids. In all the country, Alfred could barely find a handful of priests who could read and understand Latin. And if they couldn't understand Latin, they couldn't pass on the teachings of the religious books that told people how to lead virtuous lives. They couldn't save souls. Where the written word had once flourished, Alfred now found only chronic spiritual sickness. He looked for a cure. One way was to educate more clergy in Latin. But that wasn't enough. He hit on a more radical solution, a solution that hinged not on Latin, but on English. And he took English to new heights of achievement. In the preface to his own translation of Pope Gregory's pastoral care, Alfred wrote, I remembered how, before it was all ravaged and burned, I'd seen how the churches throughout all England stood filled with treasures and books. And there was also a multitude of God's servants who had very little benefit from those books because they couldn't understand anything of them since they were not written in their own language. Their own language was, of course, English. Alfred didn't want to do away with Latin, but he realized that it would be far easier to teach people to read books written in the language they spoke. The best scholars could then go on to learn Latin and join holy orders. The rest would still have access to scholarship and spiritual guidance, but it would be written in English. Here, in his capital city of Winchester, Alfred drew up a plan. It was an extraordinarily imaginative project to promote literacy and restore the English language. We should, he wrote, translate certain books which are most necessary for all men to know into the language that we can all understand and also arrange it as with God's help we very easily can if we have peace so that all the youth of free men now among the English people who have the means to be able to devote themselves to it may be set to study 
for as long as they're of no other use, until the time they're able to read English writing well. Alfred had five books of religious instruction, philosophy and history translated from Latin into English, a laborious and costly undertaking. Copies were sent out to the 12 bishops of his kingdom for their wisdom to be spread as widely as possible. To each bishop, to emphasize the importance and value of the project, Alfred sent a costly pointer used to underline the text. This is the Alfred Jewel. Many historians believe that it formed the head of one of those pointers. Crafted in crystal, enamel and gold, it was discovered in 1693 in Somerset and is now on show at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. It's inscribed, Alfred had me made, in English. Alfred the Great had made the English language the jewel in his crown. Here in Winchester, Alfred had established what was effectively a publishing house. Other projects he undertook included the commissioning of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, detailing hundreds of years of history. Alfred died in 899. One of his legacies was an English language which was more prestigious and widely read than ever before. There was nothing to compare with this range of written vernacular, history, philosophy, poetry, anywhere else in mainland Europe. English was out on its own. By the middle of the 11th century, English seemed secure, but now other invaders were waiting in the wings and English was about to face its greatest threat ever. This place, the old Roman fort at Pevensey, was a fateful one for the English language. It was here, among other places, that the Frisians and other Germanic tribes had made landfall in the 5th century and introduced their own language. Now, in 1066, another wave of invaders was landing, the Normans. When in 1066 William, Duke of Normandy, sailed with his army to claim the English throne, he was sure he had right on his side. The English king, Edward the Confessor, had spent many years in Normandy and in that time, contemporary sources say, had come to regard William as a brother or even a son and had named him as his successor. Sensing his impending death and fearing rebellion at home, the childless Edward had dispatched Harold Godwinson, his wife's brother, and as Earl of Essex, the richest and most powerful of the English lords, to Normandy to pledge loyalty to William. This Harold did, swearing on two caskets of holy relics. But when Edward did die, Harold, supported by the English nobility, had himself crowned in Westminster Abbey on the very day that Edward was laid to rest there. To the truculent and ruthless William, this was an affront. Invasion with maximum force, the only possible response. The armies met here, near Hastings. This is the spot where, traditionally, Harold fell, fatally pierced through the eye with an arrow. The site was later named after the engagement, but it's named not with an English word, like fight, but with a word from the language of the Norman victors, battle. Harold would be the last English-speaking King of England for three centuries. On Christmas Day, 1066, William was crowned in Westminster Abbey in a service conducted in English and Latin. William spoke French throughout. A new king and a new language were in authority in England. Enemy. Castle. 
castle was one of the first French words to enter the English language. The Normans built a chain of them to impose their rule on the country. This magnificent castle at Rochester was one of the first to be fortified in stone. By blood, the Normans were from the same stock as the Norsemen, who'd invaded in earlier centuries. But they no longer spoke a Germanic language, rather what we'd call Old French, which had grown from Latin roots. Many of the words they spoke would have been very strange to the native English, but would quickly become unpleasantly familiar. Our words, army, archer, soldier, garrison and guard, all come from the conquering Norman French. French was the language that spelled out the architecture of the new social order. Crown, throne and court. Duke, baron and nobility. Peasant, vassal, servant. The word govern comes from French, as do liberty, authority, obedience and traitor. The Normans took the law into their own hands. Felony, arrest, warrant, justice, judge and jury all come from French. And so do accuse, acquit, sentence, condemn, prison and jail. It's been estimated that in the three centuries after the conquest, about 10,000 French words colonized the English language. They didn't all come in immediately, but the conquest opened a conduit of French vocabulary that's remained open on and off ever since. Today, French words are all around us. City, market, porter, here we are, look, one fabulous salmon, weighs about 14 pounds. It is a fabulous fish. We've got some fabulous mackerel, they've come up from Aberdeen. Next to them are the oysters, they come from the Essex coast. Sole. Pork. Sausage. Bacon. Nice bit of fruit, a bit of oranges, a bit of juicy lemons. Grape. Tart. Biscuit. Sugar. Cream. Fry. vinegar. Nearly 500 words dealing with food, cooking and eating alone entered English from French, just a fraction of the imports which would enrich the English word hoard in the centuries after the Norman conquest. Within 20 years of taking control of the country, William sent his officers out to take stock of his kingdom. The monks of Peterborough, who were still recording the events of history in English in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, noted disapprovingly that not one piece of land escaped the survey, not even an ox or a cow or a pig. The Doomsday Book, there are in fact two volumes, show us how complete the Norman takeover of English land was and how widespread their influence and their language. The Norman settlement had concentrated the wealth of England more than ever before or since. The native ruling class from before the conquest had been slaughtered, banished or disinherited in favour of William's followers. Half of the country was in the hands of just 190 men, half of that was held by just 11 men. And not one of these great landowners spoke English. Gilberti de Gond, Raoul d'Insula. When this record of the country was drawn up, it was written in Latin, not Norman French, David de Argent, and certainly not English. Ranulf Fitzalegris. Between them, French and Latin had become the languages of state, law, the church, and history itself in England. The writing of English became increasingly rare. Even the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle guttered into silence. What? We guard in our yard a woman. The language of Alfred and the Beowulf poet had lost all the prestige that it had slowly built up. In a country of three languages, English was now a poor third, bottom of the pile. The English language had been forced underground. It would take 300 years for it to re-emerge, and when it did, it would have changed 
dramatically.